السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Thank you everybody for coming uh, to our September community night. We're very excited uh, for uh, this one. We have, mashallah, uh, two awesome guest speakers. Uh, we have uh, Ustad Daniel Hatika Chu. Um, so, uh, Ustad Daniel was born in Houston, Texas. Uh, he comes from a liberal, secular Muslim background, but he recommitted himself to Islam in high school. He studied physics as an undergraduate at Harvard University and completed graduate studies in philosophy. He has also studied Islamic tra Islam traditionally with scholars. He has written and lectured on contemporary issues surrounding Muslims in mod mod modernity, mod modernity over the past 10 years and has spoken at universities and mosques around the world. Uh, his writing can be found on, uh, online at muslimskeptic.com. Also, we're blessed to have uh, Sheikh Mustafa Omar. Small little introduction on him, inshallah. Sheikh Mustafa Omar was born and raised in Southern California. He holds a bachelor's degree in Islamic studies from the European Institute of Islamic Sciences. Um, he has a master's degree in Islamic studies from the University of Glockenshire. Did I say it right? Close. <laughs> Gloucestershire, uh, in the United Kingdom, as well as a bachelor's degree in information and computer science from the University of California. He's traveled extensively and studied under scholars around the world, particularly at Nedwatul Ulama in India and, and uh, scholars from Al Azhar and Dar al Ulum in Egypt. He has authored several books and has served as religious director at the King Fahad Mosque in Culver City, California, and the Imam and Associate Director of the Islamic Society of Corona Norco. He is currently the founder and director of California Islamic University, the Education and uh, the Education and Outreach Director at the Islamic Institute of Orange County, and the Vice Chairman of the Islamic Shura Council of Southern California. So Thank you for bearing with me with the introductions. Um, alhamdulillah, we're very blessed to have uh, Ustad Daniel Hatikachu as well as Sheikh Mustafa Omar here with us. Inshallah, the topic for today is atheism and evolution. We understand that you're probably going to have a lot of questions. So, like previous community nights, we have pre prepared the SlideU uh, app or website if you'd like to go to it. So, if you have any questions throughout the program, you can go to www.slido.com. That's www.slido.com. And the event number is B, as in Victor, 502. B502. So if you have any questions while they're speaking, um, they actually have it as well on their phone so they will see the questions that are coming up. And you can like the question if somebody asks it before you, if you want it to uh, be asked, inshallah. So without further ado, uh, we will begin the program. Jazakallah uh, khair. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, salatu wa salam ala rasulillah. Jazakallah khair, Mr. Osama, for that generous introduction. I'm very uh, happy to have the opportunity to speak with you and also be here with Sheikh Mustafa um, on these very important topics of atheism and evolution. Inshallah, I'll be giving you some uh, thoughts on evolution, hopefully addressing some questions that people have on this topic, Muslims have on this topic, and then we'll uh, transition to Sheikh Mustafa to get into atheism and then we'll have a general Q&A. Um, so please uh, submit your questions through uh, the app that Brother Osama mentioned. Uh, so explaining and talking about evolution and Islam is very difficult um, because it's a very involved, scientific, involved, philosophical topic. And trying to boil it down into something that you can present in 40 minutes or an hour or even a whole three hours is very difficult to do. And so what I'm going to present, inshallah, are some broad brush thoughts on this. 
And I thought that it would make sense to give you an analogy that will help you understand my own understanding and feeling about the broader considerations and concerns about Islam and evolution. Because I think that this specific issue really touches on uh, a much larger conflict and a much larger tension between Islam and Muslims on the one hand and the modern world on the other hand. And so if we can better understand how to address this smaller question of Islam and evolution in the right way, that will help us understand the bigger tension and the bigger conflict that Muslims need to address. Muslims as a community, our scholars, our intellectuals, and academics need to address. Why? Because the faith of our community is at, is at stake. So many uh, Muslims have doubts, shubuhat, about Islam, about the Quran, about Hadith, and the statements of the Prophet So we have to be able to address these doubts and give intellectually compelling responses that meets the challenge that we've been presented by the modern world at large and modern ideologies such as scientism, naturalism, materialism, to name just a few. So this is, this is what, it's, what is at stake, the faith uh, of our community and of our youth. So I, I thought that one way to really get across the tension is with an analogy. And I want to use the analogy of colonialism because that's something that many of you are aware of. This idea that there were, were colonial powers that came and essentially subjugated the Muslim world. They subjugated the Muslim world and the entire colonial project was to get Muslims to abandon Islam, abandon their commitment to Islam, and adopt the colonial religion or the colonial power. In a nutshell, that was the colonial project. But in everywhere that the colonizers went in the Muslim world, and even outside the Muslim world, whether it was Egypt or Libya or Tunisia or um, Iran or Pakistan, the subcontinent, I mean, they had enablers. They had people who were part of those lands, Muslims, who cheerleaded the colonizers. And they were basically saying, look everyone, we should be happy about this colonization process because they're helping us, we are benefiting from their rule, we need to accept them, we need to get with their program, we need to follow their laws. We shouldn't oppose them. And even if it might seem like what they are doing is against our interests, even though it might seem like what they're doing is harming us, is oppressing us, is injustice against us, just ignore that. Just ignore that because it's just your imagination. In fact, the colonizers are helping us. So these, this group of people I call enablers, and some of them, I'm not saying were um, you know, hypocrites in the sense that they knew that they're causing trouble and they knew that they were oppressing or enabling the oppression of Muslims. Some of them were sincere. They really did believe that European colonizing powers were going to improve the Muslim world. Okay, so they were not conscious of these conflicts, and they're not conscious of the fact that Muslims were being oppressed, and the Muslim mind was being oppressed. That Muslim thought, Islamic scholarship, was being oppressed. Okay? So this is the analogy that I want you to keep in mind, and inshallah later I'm going to explain how this is relevant to Islam and science, and Islam and evolution. So, before we get into some of the details of evolution, it's important to understand what does Islam say? And to what extent can 
we accept evolution. And when it comes to what Allah says and what the Prophet ﷺ says about human origins and the creation of mankind, it's very clear. Okay, the Quran and Hadith are crystal, crystal clear. There's no questioning what Allah says that we have all been created from one male and one female. Like Allah says this in the Quran. يَا أَيُّهَا النَّاسِ إِنَّا خَلَقَنَاكُمْ مِنْ ذَكَرٍ وَأُنْفَى O mankind, indeed we created you all from one male and one female. It's very clear that we have Adam as our father and his spouse, Hawa, as our mother. Peace be upon them. And Again, this is something that no scholar of history has questioned other than those who left the fold of Islam because of their deviance on this view. So, to, in today's world, you have many religions or religious traditions that say, who are Christian, Jewish, and they say, look, we have Genesis, we have the story of Adam and Eve, but this is all metaphor. This is not a reality. This is just allegory. We accept the theory of evolution which says that all of life is on one family tree. And all humanity has evolved from a prior species. And that the first human beings descended from a prior species. And in fact, humans and chimpanzees, humans and gorillas, humans and apes, we all have a common ancestor. Meaning, again, we're all on the same family tree. We're cousins. And furthermore, humans and bears, humans and cats, humans and dogs. We're all cousins, evolutionary cousins, because we all have one common ancestor. And everything is on the same family tree. So, in response to this scientific theory, you had uh, religious, religious traditions who said, okay, well, the science says this, and there's no doubting science, there is no questioning science, we have to accept it for what it is, and the Bible says differently, well, we interpret the Bible metaphorically. Clearly, if, this, if we took it literally, that would be a mistake, because the true history of humankind is what the scientists have described, what Charles Darwin has described. That's the reality. And then the religious texts, these are just metaphors, and people who interpret those texts literally are simply misinformed. They don't understand. As Muslims, however, we have, it's not just in today's time that you have some calling that for Muslims to interpret the Quran metaphorically with regarding Adam, Ayasana, and many other things. But this has actually this has a past tradition. You have the falasifa, what were known as the, the philosophers within Islamic history, such as Ibn Sina, Ibn Rushd, Al-Farabi. And what characterized their thinking and their thought was that all of the Quran and Hadith that conflicts with reason should be interpreted metaphorically to such an extent that they, for example, denied that the universe was created. They denied that the universe had a beginning and an end, um, which is, again, a clear contradiction in, of what Allah says in the Quran. And they denied that heaven and hell are actual places, physical places. They denied uh, miracles. And they did this because they saw a conflict between what their rationalism, Greek rationalism said, Aristotle and Plato and so forth, and what Revelation says. And so they prioritized the Greek thinking and everything else. They said, this is just metaphor. These are just stories. These are just things that we can consider to be allegory. So we have that in our history. And the Muslim scholars of those times said that, look, people who think like this, like Ibn Sina, like Ibn Rushd, and so forth, the philosophers, the they are outside of the fold of Islam. 
They're outside the fold of Islam because they deny what is clearly uh, stated, clear cut within uh, the Quran and Sunnah. So that's something that we have to all be clear about. The question then becomes, well, given this orthodox Islamic position that all scholars within Islam accepted historically, doesn't this conflict with science? Doesn't this conflict with what scientists say about human origins? I mentioned the family tree and how science, the scientific consensus is that all species are related and that there wasn't a first human being that just came from nothing. No, the first human being had a father. The first human being had a mother of a different species. Some ape-like species. So this is a clear, logical contradiction between what the Quran says and the Prophet has said and what science is. Another big contradiction is that science, the scientific consensus is that at no point in human history was the human population less than about 3,000 people. At no point historically was the human population less than 3,000 members, meaning it's impossible that humanity descended from one male and one female who lived at the same time. This is the scientific consensus, and they come to that conclusion, how? By doing DNA analysis and mathematical modeling to determine what the human population was at different points in history. So, according to that consensus, and the many papers that have been written on this subject, the human population couldn't have ever been two, Adam and Eve. That's scientifically impossible. So this is, again, a clear, direct, logical conflict. How do we understand this, and how do we reconcile this? So let me ask you all a question, and if you can just raise your hand. How many of you think that Islam and science can never conflict? Okay. How, can, how many of you think Islam and science can never conflict? So there's only two. So that means most of you think that Islam and science can conflict. Okay. So can you give me an example of that? Or they're shy. Huh? Or they're shy. Or you're shy. Yeah, you don't want to out yourself. Most of you said that they can conflict. Islam and science can conflict. So what's an example? That's very good. So for those who didn't hear the brother's response was, science evolves, science changes. One day they say you need to drink this much water to be healthy, eight glasses a day. The next day they change their opinion. So if science is constantly evolving, we know that Islam is the truth, the constant truth. And so logically, there's going, there's bound to be conflict. You also had raised your hand? Scientists claim is possible biologically, what's uh, possible given the uh, geological record. Yes, that's another good example. And I'll give you many more examples, but this was my conclusion as well, that yes, of course, science and Islam will conflict. And you often hear preachers and s certain uh, Muslims saying that Islam and science, they're always compatible and they always agree and there's never going to be any 
point where they disagree. And this is something that is promoted. And the I mentality or the idea behind it is that, well, science is the truth. Science is explaining and giving us knowledge about the way that the world really is. And Islam, Allah, the Quran, is giving us information and knowledge about the way the world really is. So there can never be any conflict between those two uh, epistemologies, those two avenues of knowledge, science and revelation. But what that argument misses is that revelation uh, or science is something that is constantly in flux. Science is constantly evolving. Science is changing. And when I study the history of science and the philosophy of science, this is something that is acknowledged by everyone. You have different paradigms. You have different eras where certain ideas about the way the world works are surpassed and they are overthrown. And new theories and new ideas about the way the world works come about. A simple example is the transition from Aristotelian dynamics. So if you study Aristotle, this was the dominant understanding of nature uh, prior to Isaac Newton, and, or prior to Galileo, is that you have four elements in the universe, like earth, fire, water, and the ether. And the reason that, you know, if I drop my phone, it falls, is because my phone is made of earth, and this table is made of earth, and so those elements attract each other. So this is Arist Aristotelian dynamics. Then you had Galileo, he had a different system. Then Isaac Newton comes and he has a completely different system that uh, does away with the elements that Aristotle discussed. Um, and then after Isaac Newton, you have Albert Einstein. And Albert Einstein presents general relativity, uh, relativistic mechanics. And so this is something that completely overturned Isaac Newton, which, what does this mean? It means that Isaac Newton was wrong. His understanding of the way that the world works was wrong. His model of, or picture of reality was wrong, okay? So you have this constant change and flux within scientific history. Another example, uh, the Greek philosophers maintained and believed that the universe had no beginning and has no end. The universe is eternal. And that was the rational conclusion and the consensus uh, in many cultures that were influenced by Greek thought, including uh, the philo Muslim philosophers, which I mentioned. But then, in the 20th century, you had the uh, cosmologists uh, within America and Europe saying that there was a Big Bang and that yes, the universe has a beginning that started with the Big Bang, and the universe actually will have an end as well. And so this became the scientific consensus, that yes, the universe has a beginning and an end. And then after that, now, nowadays, the dominant view is that there is a multiverse. And in fact, the universe doesn't have, our visible universe has a beginning and perhaps an end, but the multiverse is eternal. So once again, the scientific consensus has changed. But all of these different views are mutually exclusive. They can't all be right, but they were all part of the scientific rational consensus. So of course Islam is going to conflict uh, by logical necess uh, necessity with at least one scientific position. So logically, there's got to be uh, direct conflict between Islam and science. So how have Muslims dealt with this conflict historically? And now this is where that analogy with colonialism comes in. Because despite there being a direct conflict, we've just mentioned a few. Uh, the creativeness of the universe, uh, the origin of mankind, in light of this direct conflict, you have people, non-Muslims, Muslims, who bow down to the authority of science. And they say, look, this is what is the scientific consensus. And it might seem like there is conflict. There might seem like 
this scientific model is contrary to Islam, is contrary to the Quran, but actually that's not the case. There is no conflict. Don't worry, just ignore it. Uh, everything is fine. And this is their approach. This is their approach. This is kind of a, an avoidant approach where you avoid the problem, you avoid the conflict, and you pretend like it doesn't exist. And there are many ways, there are many uh, specific ways that Muslims advocate, uh, some Muslims advocate this kind of avoidance today. Um, for example, there's this idea that religion is only concerned with morality and spirituality, right and wrong, what happens in the afterlife. That's the domain of religion and science, that's the domain of understanding the universe, uh, doing observations, and basically understanding how the world and the physical universe works. So religion and science can never conflict because they're just about two different subjects. They're just about two different subjects. So this is one way of avoiding the conflict, but this is a, this is a terrible strategy. It makes no sense. Why? Because of course the Qur'an and revelation in general is also about the world. Allah describes the world. Allah describes the way that the world works. Allah describes how the world was created. Allah describes different forces of nature. The patterns of weather, the pattern, the motions of the stars and the planets. And these are all described by Allah in the Qur'an. So, this idea that religion is only concerned with uh, morality and has nothing to say about the physical world is false on a very cursory inspection or, or a cursory reading of the Qur'an. Another kind of avoided strategy that Muslims give and some Muslim philosophers have given is that we need to understand science as being what is true and what is in indubitable, meaning can't be doubted, on the one hand, and then there's a lot of baggage. There's a lot of metaphysical and philosophical baggage. And as long as we reject the baggage, and we ignore uh, all of the metaphysics like naturalism and materialism, then, that's, then we'll be fine. Then everything is peachy and great, because we've preserved the fact that science is true and Islam is true. Just ignore the philosophical baggage. This is actually a very common approach and it's a common uh, line of thought that you'll read in different papers that have been published recently. But this is, I think, a bad approach as well. Um, it's not a very compelling approach because when we talked, remember what we said about uh, the create, uh, createdness versus eternality of the universe. Did the universe have a beginning or not? Or is it eternal? That's not a, that's within the scientific consensus and the actual scientific papers that have been put out that will argue this based on empirical grounds, based on empirical research. Or, for example, the idea of a common ancestor and the evolutionary history of mankind and the fact that the human population could never be as small as two. Those are all within hard scientific papers using mathematical analysis, using empirical observation, uh, in order to draw those conclusions. It's hard to see, okay, where is the philosophy here? Where is the naturalism here? It seems like they're doing science faithfully without a bias. And so this shows that, okay, the conflict is actually deeper. We can't just avoid and ignore the conflict by saying, okay, this is just, we reject the naturalism, we reject the philosophical baggage, and, and we trust science. No, the actual science has conflicts and problems that we have to grapple with, okay? So these are avoidance strategies, ignoring the conflict uh, between science and Islam. And the results of this kind of approach is a loss of faith within the Muslim community. Because if we don't recognize that this problem exists, then we can't address it. And we can't 
realize the impact that it has on the way that Muslims understand themselves, they understand Allah, they understand the universe, they understand everything. If we put science on this pedestal, and we consider it to be this um, perfect, infallible avenue of knowledge, then of course that's going to affect your Iman. Of course it's going to affect how you understand other sources of knowledge, like the Qur'an, like the Sunnah. Because you can't really help how things unconsciously affect you, how things unconsciously affect your heart and mind. And we see this, we see a lot of, uh, within the past 200 years, when, Islam, uh, when the Muslim world has been introduced to uh, Western science and technology, so much apostasy being leaving Islam, so much loss of faith. Why does this happen? It's very obvious. People have taken science as the sole primary avenue of truth and understanding, or if they haven't taken as the sole primary avenue of truth, they've said that this is the main this is the strongest, this is the most powerful, the most accurate. Religion on the other hand, revelation on the other hand, this is something that, you know, is for the uneducated and, you know, it's only about how you pray and how you fast and all these scholars are, these mullahs, what are they good for? This is the kind of attitude that has been promoted within the Muslim world for over 200 years. Of course that's going to have an impact on Muslim faith. And of course that was part of the colonial project. Again, going back to this idea of how colonization it made Muslims internalize inferiority, made us internalize this idea that science is the path to truth and knowledge, and religion is at best, revelation is at best, you know, second hand, second class, can be ignored, and you don't need religion to understand the world even. Doesn't matter, we have science. So what's my approach? My approach is that we need to acknowledge the conflict. We need to acknowledge that Islam and science are in conflict, and this is, I think, apparent with, again, a very basic cursory reading of the Quran. We read about so many things where Islam, uh, where, where the Quran and Sunnah identify things about the world and about ourselves that science does not acknowledge. How many things? The Akhirah, the existence of Allah Himself, angels, jinn, barakah, okay, the barzakh. All of these aspects of the universe are not addressed or even acknowledged by science. The resurrection, the possibility that a body can be resurrected after death, completely outside of the understanding of science. All of the miracles, the mujizat of the Anbiya, the Prophets, bringing the dead back to life, splitting the moon, splitting the sea, all of these miracles completely outside the purview of science. And then here's where another avoidance strategy comes in. Because when these things are, you read them in the Quran, some say, oh, well, these are just from the ghayb. We understand that there's the ghayb and there's the shahada. The, seen, the unseen is the ghayb and the seen. And all of these things are the unseen. So again, there's a there's a sharp division between the domain of science and then the domain of religion. Religion only is concerned with the ghayb, whereas science is about the shahada, the seen. But this is not a easy division to make, because many aspects of the ghayb we do and can experience in the world. One of the biggest or the main examples are the ayat of Allah, the ayat of Allah, the signs of in creation, within creation and with ourselves. 
we see the signs of Allah. And what those do is are, they indicate and they are evidence for and they point us to the unavoidable, indubitable conclu conclusion that Allah exists and that He has created us and we must worship Him. These are the signs that Allah is constantly pointing us to in the Qur'an and as well as the Sunnah of the Prophet So this neat division between seen and unseen is not actually uh, represented within the Qur'an and Sunnah. We do have evidence of Allah, the ayat, the ayat of Allah. The other thing to, that we have to understand is that ghayb doesn't literally mean unseen, that no one has seen it. Because, for example, Allah sees everything. Allah sees everything. So nothing is technically unseen. But in, within Islamic theology, the unseen, the ghayb, has different levels. So there are some things that are unseen to the angels, but are seen by Allah. There are some things that are, unseen, that are seen by the angels, but are not seen by the jinn. There are some things that are seen by angels and jinn, but not humanity. There are some things that are seen by believers. There are some things that are only seen by the Anbiya, but are not seen by non-believers. So there are different levels and layers of the ghayb. We can't just say that, okay, whatever is ghayb is outside empirical reality. We can never see it, we can never touch it, we can never do this and that. And again, there are many examples of things that are ghayb, but they still interact with the world as Allah describes. For example, one, the famous hadith of Jibreel, the angel Jibreel. He came in the form of a man to the Prophet. Jibreel is from the ghayb, but he was seen. The Prophet saw him, the Sahaba who were with the Prophet saw him. Things like uh, jinn. I mean, people have so many jinn stories. Uh, this is technically the jinn are from the ghayb, but that doesn't mean it's impossible to see them or to see their influence. There is a really interesting article on um, possession, on people being possessed, and how there was one scientist who dedicated his entire life to studying possession, and his scientific conclusion, he was a psychiatrist, professional psychiatrist, his conclusion was that there's no natural explanation for possession. There's no way that we can explain this using scientific terms. This is definitely something beyond the empirical and beyond the scientific. And this is the conclusion that many have reached prior to you know, the advent of modern science. So this is part of the conflict. We have. Islam identifies many things that are part of the universe, part of the world, that science does not acknowledge, and vice versa. There are things that science acknowledges that Islam does not recognize, of which I mentioned as it pertains to evolution, the creation of man. Uh, science, evolutionary science says that humanity has biological predecessors. The first human being was born, whereas Islam says no. Allah says no. Adam was created from dust. Adam khuliqa min turaq. Okay, it's very clear cut. No question about what Revelation says about the origins of Adam. And in fact, in the Quran, Allah compares the creation of Adam to the creation of Isa. Isa was created with no father. Adam Islam, was created without a father and a mother. So this is cont completely contradicts the scientific consensus. And again, science acknowledges that humanity was never smaller than 3,000 in population. Very clear conflict. So how do we then as Muslims deal with this conflict? Because if you have put science on this pedestal and you view it as um, this something that can never fail, it's infallible, it has no problems, it's always accurate, 
then this is going to cause a crisis of faith. How do you deal with this conflict? And what we have to do is put science in its place. We have to recognize that science is often wrong. Science is more wrong than right, if you look at its history. It's very prone to error. And this makes sense, uh, because if you think about human beings, even, we have, sen we have five senses, okay? But how do we know that our senses are capturing all that exists? Even from a purely empirical scientific perspective. Prior to the 20th century, or pr actually 19th century, prior to the 19th century, the scientific world had no idea about x-rays, had no idea about ele the electromagnetic field. That, that's a big part of the world around us. But science just had no clue. In fact, x-rays and the electromagnetic field were discovered by accident. If that accident happened, hadn't happened, we still wouldn't, the scientific world still wouldn't have a clue about that very important aspect of reality. The problem with science is that it doesn't know what it doesn't know. And the way that I visualize this idea is think about science as a blind man, without any sense of sight, sense of hearing, sense of smell, just feeling around. Just feeling around. And whatever it happens to touch, oh, okay, the universe is a, you know, bottle of water. The universe is, you know, a rectangular solid shape. Whatever it is coming into contact with, then it extrapolates and it makes and it creates theories. <laughs> this is how we should view science, as, as a blind man rummaging in the dark. And if we look at the history of science, this makes sense. That's why you have so many changes in paradigms. You have so many different new theories that arise and other, other ones that fall out of favor. Another way to think about science that I think is important is as a tool. I'm not trying to preach anti-science or to say that science has no benefit at all for humanity. There are benefits. But just like tools have benefits. A hammer has a benefit. Screwdriver has a benefit. A vacuum cleaner has a benefit. But you're not going to theorize and think about the universe and knowledge as a whole but on the basis of a hammer. Hammer is a tool. It will help you solve a very specific kind of problem. And then for other problems, you have a different tool. And when we look at the sciences, this is actually the way it is. Because biology is very different in its methodology, in the way that it um, addresses questions, the types of questions that addresses the kind of research that it does, this kind of statistical analysis that it does, than theoretical physics. And theoretical physics is very different than experimental physics, and experimental physics is very different from chemistry, organic versus non-organic. These are all big differences. And they're not, it's not clear how these are all part of the same view or understanding of the world. And in fact, scientists and philosophers of science and historians of science have had very very have, have had a very difficult time trying to explain how all of these very different theories can all be considered science. Well, what is science? Like, what is specific about the quote-unquote scientific method that makes it scientific? This is an unresolved question. It's an unresolved question within philosophy and within science itself. And when we look at the history of science, there isn't a method, there isn't one uniform way to go about making discoveries and understanding different phenomena. What this, how I interpret this is that, yeah, of course, these are different tools. And they have very limited applicability, they have very little limited relevance outside of very specific issues and questions. So that's one way to understand science and to take it off of its pedestal and bring it down to size. And another thing to realize is that scientists themselves are not geniuses. 
And we have this kind of view of, this, of scientists as being these brilliant people who understand so much. But you know, I, I studied with physicists at Harvard. I had you know, Nobel Prize winners as teachers, advisors. And I wouldn't characterize them as having wisdom. The kind of wisdom and knowledge that we see within our tradition, within our scholars, traditionally, Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Shafi'i, Imam Ahmad, Ibn Hanbal, so on and so forth, those were geniuses. If you compare them to Stephen Hawking, or Albert Einstein, or any of these other geniuses that are considered today, there's no comparison. They don't have wisdom, they don't have that understanding that comes only from revelation, only from Allah. Allah is the only source of knowledge about the world, the reality. So we have to keep this in mind. The way to think about someone like Stephen Hawking is as a savant. Do you know the word savant? Savants are people who are very specialized and good at a specific thing. Like a savant, a chess playing savant. He's a master of chess, the game of chess. And he can play 50 people at the same time because his mind just is so fast and powerful when it comes to chess. Do we call someone who is a master of chess like a genius who understands the world and who can give us deeper insights about who we are? No. Or someone who is like a, a savant at video games, okay? Call of Duty or whatever game. Okay? No, they're brilliant masters at that one particular thing. And that one particular thing is just a game. It's just a, has very limited applicability. So again, we have to take science off of its pedestal and stop make, portraying it as the answer to questions of how the world works. Now let's get specifically to evolution. And I've said that we need to embrace the conflict between science and revelation. One thing that helps me understand how evolutionary theory itself is preposterous the thing about evolution is that people have a hard time seeing what's wrong with it because it deals with such big numbers. It kind of seems to make sense, like, okay, if you have like a hot soup, over millions and millions of years, it's going to turn into a human being, just purely through random processes. And that's, I mean, that's the theory of evolution. You have organic matter that over millions and millions of years becomes an organism and then that organism evolves and becomes a human being and the problem with that is that people don't have a sense of scale like okay um, I guess I can't really tell the difference between a million and a billion they both seem big I guess it makes sense but here's a way that, here's the uh, image that really helps me get a grasp of the numbers. So think about the most advanced technology that human beings have. The most advanced technology that human beings have. Is it an iPhone? Any an iPhone? <laughs> Apple uh, fanboys? Or think about the International Space Station. Or think about the uh, Large Hadron Collider, which is a particle accelerator that took over a decade to build. So, let's, uh, would it make sense to say after a million years, a Large Hadron Collider like that technology, or the International Space Station, after a million or a hundred million years, it can just through random processes self-generate. I guess, yeah, okay, let's just say that is possible. But the thing about that is that the International Space Station, or the most advanced piece of technology, human beings using engineering and using their understanding were able to create that technology over 10 years of development, say. Using conscious planning 
and engineering and organizing, they were able to build a 747 jet, the International Space Station, the Large Hadron Collider. But humans are, haven't been able to build even the smallest cell. All of the world's scientists and the most brilliant minds coming together and collaborating with all of the money and the, at their disposal, all the resources at their disposal, could not create a single cell. And don't take my word for it, this is something that's acknowledged by synthetic chemists. And there's one brilliant synthetic chemist named James Tour, and he explains this. He's a synthetic chemist, meaning he builds chemicals in the lab from simpler chemicals. And, he's, and he has this great video on YouTube, I highly recommend you watch it, he also has a paper explaining this. It is incredibly, incredibly difficult even to generate the smallest, in, uh, smallest or, or organic proteins. It is extremely difficult and requires a lot of money and concentrated effort to be able to do that. And that's just like the tiniest building block of what a cell is. So all of the world's most intelligent people coming together with unlimited resources couldn't even produce a cell. But they can produce all kinds of advanced technology that we see in the world today. So do you understand like a comparison here? Within a conscious process, we can produce technology, but a random process producing technology seems far-fetched. And at most, we might say, okay, over a million years or a hundred million years, a iPhone could just arise from the dust or, you know, the International Space Station or, you know, a Mercedes-Benz could just be created by a pure random chance. But that's something that humans can easily or have easily are able to build. Things like a cell are much more difficult. How can we think that within a hundred million years, something like that would be able to be produced without any conscious, intelligent creation. And just two more points, and I'll conclude, inshallah. Um, another really brilliant critique of evolution that um, I want to explain to you comes from a philosopher named Alvin Plantinga. He's actually a Christian, and he writes that everything about a human being, you have to explain in evolutionary terms, if you accept evolution. So why are our hands like this? Why are our head, why is the human head like this? Why do we have two eyes? Why do you have two ears? Explain what, um, our beliefs. How did our ability to understand the world, how did our ability to uh, understand what's true and what's false, how did that ability evolve? This is his question. And his point is that you can be very, a very successful species Meaning you can be very adaptive and you can spread your genes by having false beliefs. By having false beliefs. So you all know the idea of survival of the fittest. Whatever is the most fit to its environment will survive and reproduce. And this is how evolution works. It's called natural selection. So Plantinga says, how do our beliefs evolve? How, do our, how does our ability to tell truth from falsehood evolve? Because an animal with false beliefs, for example, imagine a tiger, or imagine a caveman, a Neanderthal. And this Neanderthal believes that tigers are friendly. Tigers are friendly. But he believes that the best way to go touch a tiger is to run in the opposite direction. This is his belief, it's crazy. He believes because of some mutation that the best, that tigers are friendly and the best way to touch a tiger is to run as fast as you can in the opposite direction. Is he gonna survive? Yes, he's going to be able to survive and outrun tigers and stay away from predators. But he has a completely false belief. He has a completely false belief about the world because tigers are not friendly. 
They're predators. And the best way to go to a tiger is to approach it, not to run away from it. So the false belief is evolving, or the false belief is spreading because it's adapting. So his point, Plantinga's point, is that our beliefs and our ability to tell truth and falsehood cannot evolve because falsehood is just as adaptive as truth. And then what that means is that if we believe that evolutionary theory is right, then our belief that it's true undermines itself. Because how do we know that evolution is correct if our ability to tell truth and falsehood is corrupted or is uh, hasn't arisen through evolutionary processes. So this is, he's showing logically how evolution undermines itself. Evolution undermines itself. So this is also a very powerful critique. And then uh, one last thing, um, I wanted to mention intelligent design as something that Muslims uh, can pursue and as another example of scientists or people who are engaged and are aware of the biological sciences who are critiquing evolution and are saying that evolution is an unsatisfactory explanation for humanity and for life and, and all of these questions. And they're pointing out that if we look at life and we look at the details of biology, there's no way that this could have come about uh, through random evolutionary processes. And this is their conclusion based on their research. I think Muslims can um, pursue that research as well and contribute to it. I know that Sheikh Mustafa is going to um, touch on this as well, inshallah. Okay, uh, let's save the questions for uh, after Sheikh Mustafa has also gone. So my talk is uh, somewhat related. Uh, the topic is about atheism specifically. So a quick personal story. So when I was young, I grew up in a Muslim family. Uh, we weren't that practicing, but we used to attend Friday prayer uh, most of the time. And uh, I was one of those kids who used to ask a lot of questions and uh, didn't always uh, get the best answers or wasn't always allowed to ask those questions. But when I got to college, uh, one of my first classes that I took was a philosophy class with critical thinking. And my professor was an atheist. And I walked into that class uh, thinking that pretty much everyone in my high school believed in God. Whether they were Muslim or Jew or Christian or whatever else, pretty much my assumption was that most people <coughs> believed in God. Um, until I went into that class and the professor himself was an atheist and one day he asked a question he said how many of you still how many of you still believe in Santa Claus you know and then people started raising their hands like no one raised their hands right for Santa Claus he goes how many of you still believe in the tooth fairy because you guys outgrew that belief right and then he asked how many of you still believe in God and you know I raised my hand and there was this one other you know, fundamentalist Christian who raised his hand, kind of a weird looking guy, he's a missionary, a little bit socially awkward, and nobody else in the class raised their hand. Perhaps because they were intimidated by the professor, or perhaps because they were genuinely confused, or they don't want to, you know, they didn't know anything about their parents' religion. And the rest of that entire class was something which, uh, in short, destroyed my faith and caused me to leave Islam and become an atheist. So this is a very uh, personal topic for me because it's a journey that I went through myself. And then Alhamdulillah, I came back to Islam and that's a, a long story in and of itself. But the reason why I mentioned that in the beginning 
is that oftentimes uh, there's a lot of people who if they've never encountered a lot of people who are atheist or they deny and say we don't believe in God at all, they, their assumption is like that they're not there or that they don't exist or that this is not really a, a, you know, a, an important topic. It's really not something that's affecting our community. But the reality is it's there. It exists. Whether people talk about it or they don't talk about it, it does exist and it affects us. So let me give you some statistics. Uh, the last major survey, one of the surveys from 2012, talks about the top uh, practiced or top practiced religions in the world. Okay, this is from adherence.com, and statistics you always have to take them with a grain of salt, but they're good approximations. So they said that Christianity has 2.4 billion adherents or followers. That's about 33% of the world's population in 2012. Islam, 1.8 billion people, which is 24% of the world's population. And the third largest religion in the world after Christianity and Islam is the secular, non-religious, agnostic, or atheist, all thrown in one category. There's 1.2 billion people in that category, 16%. Larger than Hinduism, larger than Buddhism, much larger than Judaism, much larger than Sikhism and all the other religions that are out there. So what that means, and they also say that if you, if you count this as a religion, meaning leaving, oh yeah, so if you take this as a religion, meaning not having a religion, marking yourself as none in a, in a checkbox or something like that, then what we realize is that this is the third largest religion in the world, and it's actually the fastest growing religion in the world. In terms of the number, number of people who are leaving the religion that they may have followed, and they're going into this camp. Now, just a word of caution here, the vast majority of people in this category, because they grouped everyone together, secular, non-religious, agnostic, atheist, the majority are agnostic, overwhelming majority are agnostic, and the minority are atheists. And there's a little difference between these categories. Agnostic are people who say that we really don't know. We don't know if there's a God or not. And usually people are just too busy doing other things, entertaining themselves to try and come up with an answer to that, or they're just too lazy to read, you know, or try and figure something out. So most people fall in the agnostic category, I don't know, and oftentimes they say, I don't care. Atheists are those who say, I know and I truly believe that there is no God. That's what an atheist is. But to give you a little sense of where atheists reside, right? There's a, there's a large population of secular, non-religious, agnostic atheists. If you put them all in one category, people who basically say no religion at all. No religion and God, we either we don't care or we don't know, right? Or we say that he's not there. Uh, the top 15 countries, just to show you, those who have greater than 50% population of non-religious people is Estonia, Czech Republic, Japan, Denmark, Sweden, Vietnam, Macau, Hong Kong, France, and Norway. Right? And the ones who are in the 40%, China, Netherlands, Finland, New Zealand, and the United Kingdom. Right, so these are large populations. We're talking about 40% or more, 15 countries. Some of them are very prominent countries where their populations, even though they may have a background in Christianity, you may drive around the country and you'll see churches all over the place. Those churches are all empty. Nobody's attending those churches. Those are just historical buildings that are just there for architectural, historical preservation purposes. So this is something which is growing. People's questioning belief that there is a creator who actually made everything in the world is growing. So it's important for us to understand that from the beginning. Now, a few points uh, I'll, I'll bring up. One of the reasons why people fall into this uh, religion, you can say, is that many people, they'll grow up, and when you ask them, why do you believe the religion that you're on, even Muslims, they say, why do you believe you know, the religion? They'll say, well, you know, that's what my parents taught me. Or that's just, you know, that's what I was taught. 
And when people challenge them, say, well, you just believe it for that reason, if they don't have a good answer, or they're not taught a decent answer, it starts to make them question. This is something which the Qur'an addresses. The Qur'an addresses the, the idea of blind belief. And it says that that should not be the default position for anyone who's believing in Islam. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Qur'an in Surah Al-Baqarah, He says, وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمُ اتَّبِعُوا مَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهُ He says, when it is said to them, follow what Allah has revealed, meaning the truth. These people, what do they say? قَالُوا بَلْ نَتَّبِعُوا مَا أَلْفَيْنَا عَلَيْهِ آبَاءَنَا We follow what our forefathers used to follow. I mean, that, that's sufficient as an argument. And the Qur'an's response is, أَوَلَوْ كَانَ آبَاءُمْ لَا يَعْقِلُونَ شَيْئًا وَلَا يَهْتَدُونَ He says, the response is, what if your forefathers, they didn't understand anything, or they were not correctly guided? What if they were not on the truth? Is it sufficient for you to simply say, I just follow what I, you know, what I believe? So the Qur'an is teaching something very different, whereas many people of different religions, they teach that you have to have like this leap of faith, and not rationalize, understand, you know, why you believe what you believe. And it's very important for people to understand that. So there is a perception among many people that people who are religious, regardless of what religion they're following, they have like this blind faith, and they don't have any reasons for believing what they believe. There's a perception. It may not be reality, it may be reality for some people and not for others, but the perception is there and the propaganda is there is that these people are backwards and they don't really know what they're saying and all of that. So that's problematic. And it's very important for us to have a strong, rational foundation for our belief. Rational not in the sense of reason that Daniel was mentioning with the Muslim philosophers of the past, but rational in the sense that you have good reasons for believing, and there is very good reasons for having that. Right? So we'll talk about that in a moment. The second thing is that one of the challenges that people will encounter is that what is the default position? Right? If, if you're in high school, and your friend comes and asks you, you say, oh, you believe in God? You say, yeah, I believe in God. Oh, well, what's your proof that God exists? You know, the average middle schooler or high schooler, they don't know exactly what the response is unless they have a good education, right? So their response is like, well, you know, uh, I mean, everyone believes in God. They may say that, and that's an answer, but you know, they may say something else, and they say, well, the friend may come along and say, well, until you prove to me that God exists, I, don't, I, will, I will not believe in Him. I don't believe that there's a Creator until you show me the proof, the evidence. Where is the evidence? So basically what they're saying is that the burden of proof is on you because you believe in God. Why? Because you're making the claim. We're not making a claim for anything. We're denying a claim. All the burden of proof lies on you. The problem with this, there's two problems with this. Problem number one is this is not how reality functions. Okay, so there's uh, Dr. Jafar Sheikh Idris, one of the scholars, a very amazing philosopher, uh, amazing, amazing scholar. He says this is a wrong analogy and it's a wrong way of looking at it. You know, you're the accuser and there's the accused, accused. There's like basically someone is guilty, uh, or innocent before proven guilty, right? Unless you have proof some, some evidence against them. And he says this analogy is wrong. The burden of proof doesn't just lie on the person who's believing in God. He says, look at another scenario. If you walk into a crime scene and you see that there's a dead person on the floor and you're a detective and I'm a detective and we're both looking at this and we're trying to figure out, okay, there's a gun on the floor, there's a bullet hole inside the wall, the glass is open, okay, we're detectives and we go and look, we're trying to figure out what caused this death to happen. Was it a murder or was it a suicide? Or, you know, what happened? So you come up with a theory. And you say, well, my theory is, as an investigator, well, the door seems to be open. There seems to be a bullet coming this way. There seems to be a footprint over here. And you say, you know what? My theory is, this person was murdered and this is not a suicide. And the other person, the other detective comes along and says, no, I don't reject that theory. That's, you haven't given me enough proof. You say, okay, well, what's your theory? What's your explanation for this? So I don't need an explanation. The burden of proof is on you. You need to show me more proof because I'm not convinced as to what you're saying. But the reality is that you can't just reject something like that. You have to offer an alternative theory. Why? Because you're standing in the middle of a crime scene. You're standing and there's a dead body there and there's a gun there. 
And your job is to sit there and give an explanation. You cannot simply say, I don't like your explanation, but I will offer no counter explanation whatsoever. And this is a very good analogy for belief in a creator. Why? Because this world exists. And we perceive, we see everything around us. Right? We measure, we see the mountains and the trees and the human beings and people walking and thinking and you know, doing all of these things. You need an explanation. You're offering an explanation for why all of this exists the way that it exists. So you're saying, you know what? I don't believe that all of this was created by a in, in, in superior intelligence, which we call God. That's my explanation. If someone comes along and says, well, you know, that's not enough proof for me. Show me your, your proof. That's, you have to show me in detail what your proof is. So you have to ask them, what is your alternative explanation? So, well, there's, I'm the one who's, I don't have to provide any evidence. Right? The, all the burden of proof is on you. Not really. That's not the way this scenario works. The fact that you exist in the world and you're seeing the world and you're living in this world and you're observing all of these things, you're offering an explanation for why things are the way they are. If someone wants to reject that, they have to provide an alternative explanation. So the burden of proof, according to Dr. Uh, Dr. Uh, Jaffer, uh, is not just on one side. There's two explanations and you can't say one is on the other side. So that's one way of looking at it. And this is important because a lot of people, a lot of Muslims, they go to school and they're like, oh, Lord, we believe in a creator because of all this. And you have some people coming them and challenging them. And saying, you know what, no, I don't accept that. You have to show me proof. Where's the proof? Show me something. So they'll show them like, you know, Okay, let me show you the linguistic miracle of the Quran or something like that, which is, which is cool and, and good, but that's not necessarily what you need to show them when talking about you know, proof for a belief in a creator or in an intelligent designer. There's another thing though. In fact, it's been argued strongly that the burden of proof is actually on the atheist. Right? And the reason why that is, is because the human mind, the way that it's constructed, is actually naturally inclined to look at something that's so complex, like this world in which we live, and say that there must have been a designer for this design that we perceive. And this is interesting because this research is coming out of universities where the majority of researchers in that department are probably agnostics or atheists. So I'm pretty much going to be quoting, for the most part, uh, people who are either non-religious or they're atheists or about agnostics for most of this research here. So, there was a study done in, 20, in 2011 by Oxford University. And this is one of the largest studies of its kind. There were 57 researchers who conducted 40 separate studies across 20 different countries. Right, so a very diverse range of different cultures and backgrounds. And in the conclusion, what they found was, they said that belief in God is something that is actually natural to the human mind. It's just natural. So one of the people who was part of that study was Dr. Justin Barrett. Doesn't believe in God, but he still admits. He, he writes, he's part of the Center for Anthropology and Mind. And anyone pretty much in the anthropology department, he's pretty much gonna be an atheist or agnostic. It's very rare to find people in the, in the field of anthropology. And if you take a class on anthropology, you probably have your, your faith challenged uh, significantly. So you should think about before enrolling into one of those courses. So he says, the preponderance of scientific evidence for the past 10 years or so has shown a predisposition to see the natural world as designed and purposeful, and that some kind of intelligent being is behind that purpose. So he summarizes what he's saying. Okay? He says, if we threw a handful of people on an island, and they raised themselves, he says, I think that they would end up believing in God. If they were just left without any propaganda, any programming and all of that stuff, they would probably believe in God. Why? Because everything they see and they perceive, the human mind believes in this, you know, perceives this cause and effect and wants to uh, you know, attribute, this, how did all of this come about? And naturally, the natural conclusion is this was designed by some intellectual, superior you know, intellect. So that's what he says. Then you have Professor Pascal Boyer, who's an anthropologist again at Washington University, most likely an atheist or an agnostic himself. He says, religious thinking seems to be the path of least, res least resistance for our cognitive systems. Meaning it's, it's the, be believing in God pretty much is something that just comes natural to the human mind. And then he goes, by contrast, disbelief is generally the work of deliberate 
effortful work against our natural cognitive dispositions. Hardly the easiest ideology to propagate. It is very difficult to spread atheism because it's so hard for people to actually process that because it goes against what you're naturally inclined to be thinking about something in the first place. So you can make an argument that the burden of proof is actually on the atheist. Why? Because the human mind perceives things this way. Imam Fakhruddin al-Razi, one of the great early scholars, I think he was around uh, 7th or 8th century, something like that, he said, you know, even a child understands this. So if you stand behind a rock, right, and you're hiding somewhere, you take a little pebble and you throw it near a child, right, and it, and it lands. The child is going to look around and start wondering, you know, where did this rock come from? Because their perception is there in cause and effect. The child is not going to be like, hmm, I wonder, maybe just all of a sudden, all of the particles in that rock somehow randomly happen to move, hit me in the back, and then randomly move back, you know, on the other side. That doesn't really happen. No, even children understand it. Of course, there's some very famous atheists today, like Richard Dawkins, who believes actually the opposite. So Richard Dawkins is a very famous, uh, infamous uh, atheist uh, professor in the UK. He's written several books. Many people have stopped believing in God because of him. And he actually says in one of his books, he says, you know what, if, if somebody sees a miracle happening, like they see like a statue waving to them, he's talking against Christians. He says, you know, you should not believe that it's a miracle. It's because there's a possibility that all of the atoms of the statue's hand somehow moved in exactly the same time towards one direction and then moved back. And he says, look, I know it's a very unlikely possibility, but scientifically, that's what we have to believe. And that's what you should believe. Right? Now that's not, it's, it's arguable whether that's science or not, right? So this is, this is something that human beings naturally understand from the get-go, okay? And that's why atheists have always been a minority of a minority throughout history. In fact, most of the verses of the Quran, they don't directly address atheists as much as they address people who are associating partners with Allah. And the reason why, and they do address it, it's addressed in the Quran, but it's not addressed as much. Why? Probably because for most people, belief in God is something quite natural. Now how is it established and how do we understand it today, particularly with the knowledge that we have about the world? Well, there is the concept of design, right? Daniel mentioned intelligent design. So what design basically means is that things are, they exist in a particular way rather than existing in all the other potential ways in which they could have existed. And that's what we talk about with design. So Allah says in the Quran, He says, surely we have created each and everything by a precise measure. Meaning everything has been created in a particular way which has a specific measure or a specific plan, you can say. There's, there's, there's uh, proportions, uh, balance that exists within it that is particular for a specific way. What is the opposite of design? The opposite of design is called chaos. Chaos is a theory. It's basically, chaos is something that has no rules. There's no rules, there's no order, there's no purpose that you can perceive that exists in those things. So if we look at this world in which we live, and you look at all the connections and how things are interrelated, you realize that all of these things exist in a particular way. Let me give you a simple example. If you look at heat, right? If you want to warm your food, just think of a very primitive society, okay? You want to warm your food, and you're trying to light a fire. What's going to happen if one day, you try to light a, you ignite a spark and you're trying to light a fire, and one day, it ignites a fire, a spark comes out. The next time you try to make a spark, and something freezes. The next day you try it again, it explodes. The next day you try it again, and you know, some, I don't know, flower comes out or something weird. There's no consistency in the world at all. You would not be able to live, you would not be able to survive because you don't know what to do. You drink water one day and it quenches your thirst. The next day you drink the exact same thing, no change whatsoever, and now all of a sudden it's poison that kills you. How would you, you would not know what to do. So that's what Allah is mentioning in the Quran, that everything has been created with a specific measure, meaning for a specific purpose. And Allah mentions that in the Quran, He says, you do not see any fault or incongruity in the creation 
of Ar Rahman, of the All Merciful. And it says, look again. Can you see any rifts? I mean, can you see anything that's that's messed up in a way that shouldn't be there? Right? So that specific order, which was designed for a purpose, is not going to be violated. So when we understand that, and when we, we reflect upon that, there's a lot of there's been a lot of new experiments and observations that have actually give us a better understanding of certain aspects of our world and how these things function. So let's take one example of a manifestation of something that appears to be designed in this world. So, every living thing in this world is composed of atoms. And in those atoms, there's certain particles that exist. And if you look at the human body, does anybody know how many cells are in your human body? Your cells, in all living things, right? How many cells are in your human body? Does anyone know, approximately? Huh? 3,600 cells? A lot more cells. <laughs> that would be very problematic. A good guess, but that would be very problematic. We scratch off our skin cells and then we'd be in trouble. Does anyone have an idea? There's 100 trillion cells. Okay, 100 trillion cells in our body. And how many atoms are in each human cell? 100 trillion. So 100 trillion atoms in a cell and 100 trillion cells in the human body. Right? So if you, just, if you think about that, right, if there was some imbalance in those cells, and they weren't ordered and structured in a particular way, the human body would not be functioning the way that it does. But there's a specific order, there's a specific ba balance, there's a specific structure there. Right? So what does that do? That indicates a certain amount of planning, a certain amount of purpose that exists. Right? Now that's just the things that we know about in a more complex state. If you look at it even from Look at what did the Arabs 1400 years ago in the desert know, right? Or, I mean, okay, maybe not the desert. Arab philosophers in the Middle Ages, what did they know? They knew that, they knew about the planets, they knew about the earth. I mean, they knew how, if, if our planet Earth was a little bit closer to the sun, what would happen? If it wasn't in the perfect balance that it's in, we'd all burn up and die. If it was just a little bit further, what would happen? We'd all freeze and we'd die. The fact that we exist and we're able to breathe and we're not burning up and our planet happens to be exactly the perfect distance from the sun and is spinning in a particular way and gravity is causing uh, you know, us to not have the earth spin off in you know, the, some other you know, direction to cause us to you know, not be able to regulate our temperature. The fact that we have an ozone, you know, the, the, the atmospheric layer which is preventing the sun's rays from coming and burning up our skin. All of these things are in a perfect balance. Right? They're in a balance with the functioning existence of life. So now, when we look at all of these things, we can look at so many things from the digestive system, we can look at this, you know, the immune system of a human being, we can look at so many different processes. At the end of it, it all comes down to two, two explanations. Either all of these things, the 100 trillion cells in the human body, exactly our distance from Earth to the Sun, the fact that we have an atmosphere that's protecting us from burning up, either all of this is a result of chance, meaning it's just a coincidence, all of it just kind of happened to be in exactly the perfect place, at the right place, at the right time, or it was actually designed with a purpose. And if it's designed with a purpose, that means that there has to have been something that has the knowledge and the power and the wisdom to design it in this particular way. So how do you determine, how do you go between these two, how do you decide between these two options? These are pretty much the two options when it comes down to the idea of atheism. Most people who are atheists, they say that this world is a product of chance. That we as human beings were a product of chance. That our universe, or multiverse, or whatever it may be, where everything just happened to be a coincidence. And they say, we know it's a very low probability, right? We're like, we're like the winning the lottery, you know? Lottery is very difficult to win, but people do win the lottery. They say, well, we believe that everything exists the way it exists because it just happened to be that way. It was just a coincidence that all of this happened. Now, First of all, let's just say we didn't have any other information. We didn't have any other knowledge about anything that I'm about to present to you. Basically, what it's coming down to 
is that the belief that all of this happened through a particular design is like 99% or more. But the belief that it was just a coincidence is like 1%, right? Even if we didn't have all the up-to-date uh, experiments and everything else, which I'm about to tell you right now, still, if someone wants to believe something is like 1%, you know, likely to have been true versus 99%, is that how people decide, make their decisions? Like if someone is going like, you know what, I'm gonna decide between going down this road, which is, has a 99% chance of getting me to my destination, or this other road, which has a 1% chance of getting me to my destination. You know, I think I'll go with the 1%. One. People don't make decisions like that. People decide based upon what is the more likelihood, unless they have some other reason to not want to accept that thing. And that's what atheism is gonna come down to, okay? But we don't really need to even worry about that anymore because we know certain things. We know certain things about mathematical impossibilities or improbabilities, you can say. So probabilities in mathematics are calculated in a particular way. I'm gonna give you a very quick review, okay? If you take 10 marbles and you label each one, one, two, one through 10, you throw them in a bag, okay? What is the probability that I'm gonna randomly pull out the number three? on the first try? 10%, right? One in 10, okay? So 10% chance, I'll pull out the number three, okay? If I'm gonna say, okay, you know what? I'm gonna pull out the number one two times in a row, or the number three, let's say. I'm gonna pull out the number three two times in a row. What's the probability of that? 1%. There's one chance in 100. You go 10, multiplied by 10, you add, you don't add, you multiply, right? So you get one in a hundred possibility, right? So what's gonna happen is, what's the probability that you're gonna draw out the number three 10 times in a row? One in how many times? Yeah, one in 10 to the 10th power, excellent. So one in, one in 10 billion chances, right? One in 10 billion chances. So now, if you ask yourself, or if you ask a scientist that, okay, we have this human cell that exists within us, within the cells, there are proteins that actually help form that human cell, right? So we have, if we say, let's just say all of this randomly formed by chance. We know that there are 92 elements you know, from the periodic table, when you take chemistry, there's 92 elements that are found in nature. And you need to have five specific elements necessary for life to combine in exactly the right measure to form one protein molecule which is going to eventually have other processes to make one cell. So there was a Swiss mathemat mathematician, Charles Eugene Guy, he calculated the pro probability of this happening. So he said, look, if you take into consideration the quantity of matter that exists in the entire world and the time that would be needed for this to actually come about, the probability of a chance formation of one protein which is necessary to make life, not a cell, just one of the proteins, is 1 in 10 to the 160th power. So what is 10? To, again, it's hard to visualize this, right? Oh, it's, just, it's just a large number. Okay. 10 to the 160th power basically means, you know, a million is 10 to the 6th power, so six zeros. Nine zeros is a billion, right? So this is a number with one, and you've got 160 zeros after it. There's no name for that number that we really even, no one really knows what it is, probably. So that's a really, you know, very, very low probability chance that that's actually ever gonna happen. And that's just one step, one small step in order to actually, you know, produce one human cell. Now the thing is, what's more interesting is that some people, they still believe and say, you know what, no, I still believe that this could happen by chance. I still believe that. Why do they believe that? They said, well, if we try enough times and there's enough people working on it daily, randomly, so they say, oh, you know, people are like, oh, well, computers can process things so quickly and we can churn out all of these numbers, so there must be a way that they can Come, you can you can get to this number. This is the common response of most people who are agnostic or atheists who, who don't believe in a creator. They'll say, well, you know, you can make an argument. 
And this argument is an old argument. This argument was made by Julian Huxley, who was a big proponent of Darwinism. He made this argument a long time ago, and he basically said, it's called the monkey theorem. He said, if you put a bunch of monkeys inside of a room, and they're typing on typewriters, right? Imagine computers now, right? They're banging on the keyboard randomly. He says, after a while, you will eventually get these, a sonnet of Shakespeare produced with one of them. Because if you have enough random combinations, you know, if you randomly just push a bunch of buttons on the keyboard, eventually you're going to get a word. Eventually you're going to get a sentence. And you keep going for a very long period of time. Eventually it's going to happen. So the argument that's being made is that if these chemicals keep trying to combine randomly and just form by chance. If it happens enough times, then eventually one time they're going to get it right. And this is a very common argument you're going to encounter. You go to a university, most professors will make this argument. And this is probably the most common uh, refutation or response to the idea of intelligent design. The problem is, it's false. And the reason why it's false is because they actually did an experiment in the UK recently and they said, okay, let's go ahead and put a bunch of monkeys, just for, the, for, just for the joke of it, put a bunch of monkeys inside of a cage on computers with a, type, with, a, with a keyboard and let them bang around and do it and all of this stuff. So they did that and they let them hit around the keyboard and everything. The monkeys were kind of like, you know, using the computer as a, as a toilet as well. But other than that, they were, you know, doing all of this and they're recording everything that the monkeys are doing just for, just for the sake of it, checking the experiment. And what did they find? After one month of having this done for the entire time, the monkey did not even produce one word. Not one English word. Now what's, what are the shortest words in the English language? I, A, right? I mean, one letter. They could not produce one. Why? Because you have to have a space before the I, or at least if you start with the I, you have to have a space after the I, or a space after the A and before the A, or unless it's you know, capital in the beginning. They could not get one word, right? So what happened was they said, okay, this argument that they can produce a Shakespeare sonnet, okay, a Shakespeare sonnet is 488 letters per page. If they were randomly gonna come up, come up with this and somehow try to get it, the probability of this is 26, uh, multiplied itself by 488 times. So 26 to the 488th power. In base 10, that's 10 to the 960th power. Just to produce one page of Shakespeare's sonnet. Okay? Now you think about that. The number of particles in the universe that we know of is 10 to the 80th power. That's the number of particles that we know. So what they said was, the probability of this actually happening, as it's been argued, is so slight that it's, it's actually impossible. If you took the whole universe, thinking about how many particles there are, and we convert every single one of the particles into a computer chip, and the computer chip is processing at maximum speed random calculations, you would still not be able to produce one, one sonnet of Shakespeare. Let alone, let alone a cell, let alone a protein that's going to somehow eventually produce a cell. So that's really important to understand that. So that argument has been completely destroyed, meaning believing in coincidence, knowing what we know about the world and the universe, at least based upon our current knowledge, it's almost no one can actually argue that this is something that you can technically believe in. And that's kind of what the argument that was being presented before is that someone said, look, to put it in layman's terms, okay, if somebody showed you an airplane, 747 jet, okay, and they say this was assembled because there was this tornado, it started moving really fast, and it went through a junkyard, and there was a bunch of metal scraps and stuff like that, and all of a sudden the tornado picked up all of these parts and randomly assembled it into this airplane. Most people would not believe that. And someone comes along and says, well, if there was enough tornadoes and enough chances and enough potential times that just keep on, kept on happening, which doesn't happen in nature, by the way, it doesn't just keep on repeating itself. But even if it did, the probability that it would be somehow produced randomly like this is virtually, virtually impossible, if not impossible. 
right? So this is one of the major uh, you know, reasons why people end up in atheism because they're not aware of how to process uh, these type of probabilities. The last thing, and I'll conclude with this, and I'll just spend a little bit of time on this. Most people in the world who are agnostic, their problem is not so much believing that there is an intelligent creator. In fact, most people, I mentioned the statistic really high, right? People are agnostic atheists, over a billion people. Most people are upset by you know, the religion or religious people that they've encountered. There's emotional trauma that's there. They've had a bad experience with you know, people you know, trying to push their ideas on them or treating them bad or whatever it may be. So there's an emotional component there. And one of the other emotional components which is a mix of emotional and intellectual argument, but I'd, I'd say it's more emotional than intellectual, is the argument that if God existed and that there was an intelligent designer and creator, that there wouldn't be all of these bad things happening. Right? And, and the problem with the argument is it's a lot, it's a fallacy actually. Because the idea is that, you know what, if God knows everything, if Allah knows everything, then, you know, and if, he, if He's able to do everything, which is how we define Allah, which is how most people define God, well, why didn't He stop this bad thing from happening and this bad thing from happening? No, nothing bad would happen in the world. And a lot of people, they're, this is what bothers them. And what leads them to kind of start having doubts about Allah and all of that. Now the answer is long, but the short answer is that from the Islamic perspective, we are in this world because we're being tested. This is not our final abode. This is not paradise. So evil does exist. And yes, Allah set up the world so that bad things can happen. And sometimes He will stop them and sometimes He will not stop them. And if Allah stopped every single bad thing from happening in every capacity, then there would not be a test. So if you're sitting there in a classroom and your teacher gives you a test, an exam, right? You're being tested from your perspective. You know that this is a test. And you're sitting there and you're struggling with one of the questions and you're just getting frustrated, you're getting upset. You're just like, you know what? You get upset at the teacher and you go, you know, forget you. I don't know why, why do you have to test me like this? I don't believe you exist. You know, the conclusion doesn't make sense. The fact that you're being tested has nothing to do with the fact that a creator exists or doesn't exist. Right? So that's a, that's a problem and people have issues with that. But the Islam puts things into perspective for people and reminds us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us in order to be tested. He is still merciful. He does not test us more than our capacity. And in the things that happen in this world, there's always some good for the believer who can process it. Either they're going to be patient and they're going to be rewarded for that and they'll get paradise in the next life. Or there's something that they will learn in this life from their experience and they'll grow stronger and they won't make the same mistakes again and it'll help them in their life. There's always some underlying wisdom of why it exists. So the question is, what is the wisdom behind this evil? Not so much about why this bad thing somehow is going to lead me to disbelief in God. So inshallah, uh, those are just some of the few things we wanted to cover and we'll open it up to questions. So we have a lot of questions already that came in from the first presentation. I'm going to re-enable my internet to find out how many more questions came in. Do you have it open? I'll open it. Alright. You want to take some of these? Start from the top. Start from the top, I guess. The top question is, I know some of the best. Yes. So, there. Uh, one with a high. Is what scientists say about height correct, or is the Quran correct? So, about the height of Adam A.S. Um, so there are hadith where the Prophet ﷺ describes the height of Adam as being, um, I forgot the exact number, 40, 70 cubits. So, is what does science have to say about this? Well, this is, as was mentioned before, a, um, a clear conflict between what science claims is possible and what we find within hadith. I think our approach here is, again, if we recognize the limitation of science, um, we can take the words of the Prophet for what they are. And I think that level of respect and love for the Prophet and his words 
will guide us to take what he says and within Sahih Hadith, um, in our tradition, and be able to interpret that and say, well, clearly the Prophet knows and has been given knowledge that we don't have, and maybe we will never be able to see and verify, but we take what the Prophet says at his word, and he's describing something that he knows and he has seen and we do not have access to. As far as like people's height, um, another aspect is like people's age. So within the Quran, uh, different people are mentioned as having very, um, living to a, a very long life, over 900 years. Nuh for example, or Khidr, or the Ashab um, al the youth of the cave. So a good um, way to understand it is that recently there have been animal species that lived for centuries. So there was a recent discovery of a shark that lives in the Arctic called the Greenland shark. And the age biologists, marine biologists verified that this shark was, has been living for over 450 years. Um, other species uh, have been discovered like uh, fish and even reptiles that live for centuries like tortoises, for example, a long time have been known as living over 200 years. So this tells us that there's not no real logical reason why a human can't live to be such an age. And there's no logical reason why um, a person, sure, we just hold it, okay, and pass it. And there's no logical reason why a person uh, can't live to be a thousand years old. Um, biologically, it's possible. Um, now that's being acknowledged. And I don't think that it's logically impossible for humans that have been much, much taller than they are in their current state. There's also, um, I have a collection of articles that I've saved um, from reputable sources showing that there are many uh, fossils that have been found of very large human-like skeletons. And the geologists discovering these don't know what to make of them, but they're actually very large in size and they appear to be human. And some of them are even displayed in museums. And people or skeletons as large as 10 feet or 11 feet. And this is part of the historical record and it's not really addressed in the uh, mainstream biological sources, but this is something that the documentation is there. If anyone is interested in seeing that, um, you can ask me about it. I also have it on my website, uh, MuslimSkeptic.com. So I don't see any problem with taking this hadith uh, at, at face value. Uh, so yeah, with regards to the hadith, uh, it's also important to understand that Muslim scholars have actually viewed the hadith differently. Uh, so there's two interpretations. One of them is that you know Adam was 70 cubits, and then he uh, consistently human beings consistently decreased over time. So that's one reading of the hadith. That's not the only reading of the hadith among traditional scholars. So Imam uh, Anwar Shafi'i and some other scholars they said that the language here basically what it means is that Adam was 70 cubits originally when he came to Earth. He was decreased, and then he's going to return back to the original state. So that is not constantly decreasing over time, but that his earthly existence was decreased, not that there's a gradual decrease taking place. So there are two interpretations, regardless of which one. I mean, either way, this is not a, a this is not really an issue. But it's important to realize that sometimes we need to understand the hadith uh, in a in a proper manner before we decide whether there's even a conflict between science uh, and what Islam says. Uh, move to the next one. Uh, evolution is a theory, how has it been accepted as reality and why have Muslim scientists not made a bigger effort in proving this theory is false? So with, I think why evolution has been accepted I think that there's been a lot of promotion of evolutionary theory. 
and there is a lot of interesting books that have been written about how Charles Darwin actually was uh, very heavily promoted by atheists beyond the merit of his actual work. And when The Origin of Species was published, the scientific community at that time had a lot of questions uh, and didn't feel like he presented a very compelling case because he didn't explain how uh, diversity um, within a population of organisms could arise because at that time they didn't have understand an understanding of genetics and genetic mutation. So Darwin's theory as he, as he wrote it was incomplete within the origin of species. Nonetheless, um, people like Aldous Huxley um, and other non-scientists saw this as a great opportunity for atheists to finally have an answer to uh, theists and to Christians and other believers in saying that, okay, look, you asked, him, you asked us and you challenged us to explain why or how humanity and all of this design and all of this creation could have come from nothing. Well, here is an explanation. Darwin has explained it. This is showing how you can explain uh, the origin of life and the diversity and complexity of life without appealing to a divine source. And so they jumped on this opportunity and they heavily promoted um, Darwinism despite the lack of scientific merit that the theory actually had because of the questions that Sheikh Mustafa and myself uh, brought up. And that, that kind of ideological commitment to evolution is present today. Some of the most vocal proponents of evolution are not scientists. They're actually atheists and they view this as a way to uh, bash believers and, and show them that, oh look, you're irrational for thinking that the Bible or the Quran is tr literally true and now we are more enlightened and we understand the true origins of uh, all life and humanity. So there's a lot of bias, there's a lot of propaganda, exaggeration. Um, there's, there's a very interesting book called What Darwin Got Wrong. It's written by an atheist named Jerry Fodor. And in this book, Fodor is an atheist, he critiques evolutionary theory and Darwinism in particular, and he describes in the introduction of his book that in writing the book, many of his academic colleagues approached him and said, don't write this book. Um, we don't have any problems with your conclusions. We, don't have, we understand that you're raising actually legitimate criticisms of evolutionary theory, but don't write this because you're giving ammo to uh, religious people. And so this was kind of a glimpse of what happens behind the scenes um, at academic institutions. So there's a very big bias in academia against religion and in favor of evolutionary theory, and that's why it has enjoyed the kind of uh, promotion and prominence that it has over the decades. Um, just, inshallah, we'll take three more questions. Inshallah, uh, I'll just uh, pick a few random ones, inshallah. Um, who designs the design? Uh, the short answer is uh, no one. If the burden of proof is on the atheist, does not the theory of evolution give them that argument? I'll let you know, inshallah. So, the answer is no, it doesn't give them the argument, but they think it does. So the thing is, prior to, you know, Richard Dawkins actually mentions, he says, prior to Darwin, it was very difficult to be a rationally fulfilled atheist because you don't have any explanation or mechanism to believe that uh, you know, all of this came about through some process. You, can, you can't explain things. So he says, post-Darwin, we, we can at least have an explanation uh, or a response as to why all of this happened. The problem is, though, is that the more we understand the processes, the more we understand about the world, the more we believe that the idea of chance or random formation of everything coming together in order to form the complexity that we know in this world, the, the further and further uh, we believe it's actually possible. 
So actually things have not changed. And what's happening is people, people are actually reversing their position. A very uh, interesting example was uh, Professor Anthony Flew. So one of the books that I was reading in that philosophy class that I mentioned to you, actually I'm reading outside of the class, additional reading for myself, was Anthony Flew, and I used to read his arguments on atheism, he's one of the reasons why I left Islam and became an atheist. What's really interesting is in 2008, he publicly declared, published a book that says he changed his mind after 50 years of being one of the world's most prominent atheist philosophers, that he switched and he says, you know what, I actually do believe in God now because now I understand uh, different arguments. I've revised my understanding of Darwinism, of evolution. I have a better, I've been discussing with people for a very long time. And he reversed it. He wrote a really interesting book. It said, it's called, it's, it's called There Is a God. But it says on the cover, there is no God. And then the no has an X over it. And he changes it written in with the A. And he changed his mind. It's how the world's most notorious atheist changed his mind. So it's a really interesting read. Um, and so people are changing over, realizing that it becomes more and more difficult the more we learn about the world to actually remain an intellectually fulfilled atheist. According to scientific data, the Earth is 4.5 billion years old. How does this not estimate the Earth? How old Earth? Uh, well, sorry, I didn't hear that. According to scientific data, the Earth is 4.5 billion years old. How old does it stand as to the Earth to be? Um, so there's no conflict between anything within Quran and Sunnah and, and es estimating scientific estimates putting the age of the Earth at billions of years. So there's no estimate that we can derive uh, from Revelation. Um, there's no conflict there with what uh, the current scientific consensus is. Allah will add, we don't need to confirm it and say that it's for sure true or disconfirm it. Okay. There, was one, there was one question that the uh, brother asked before that I wanted to address. Like, What is the practical um, takeaway in terms of what we teach our kids about evolution? Because they're going to school, they're learning this, or what should be taught at Islamic schools? I think that it's important if for Islamic schools to teach what is taught at other schools just so that students are aware of what the evolutionary theory is because they'll, they'll definitely be exposed to it when they go to college. But then at the same time, bringing in the resources from intelligent design specifically. And there are a lot of great books and material that has been written such a, from authors like Stephen Mayer, Michael Behe, for example, the Discovery Institute. They have a lot of uh, very insightful work um, and they follow uh, academic standards. And I think that kind of material is great to expose Muslims to and introduce uh, young Muslims to this critique of the status quo, critique of what is considered scientific consensus, so that inshallah they'll be able to produce their own work and contribute to that uh, discussion in a way that's true to Islam. I uh, just have one quick basic question. Why, why, we, why can't we reference to verses, uh, to, to verses that coincide with modern science and providing proof of God's message?
I think the problem with Tafsir Enemy is that, again, you've put science on this pedestal as the judge of what is true and false. And so if you give science that kind of authority and that kind of power, you, you know, like you live by the sword, you die by the sword. Because there are other parts of the Quran that clearly contradict scientific consensus and scientific facts. So when you come across those ayat and come across those passages, then your faith is going to be questioned. And because science, the, what, who you made the authority, says that that's false. So this is a recipe for disaster. It's just much intellectually safer and actually more intellectually consistent to have our yaqeen in the word of Allah and His Messenger وسلم, That's our grounding, that's our anchor And then we judge other philosophies and other ideologies According to the Quran and Sunnah Because we put the haq on that pedestal And judge everything else according to its standard Just make one quick concluding remark on that So, uh, oh, okay. concluding remark, go ahead you know, the reason I say there's no conflict between Quran, Sunni, and, and, and science, because science we are lacking a lot. So what we know now is very little, and as we, we learn more, we can see all the to the fit. So uh, the most important thing is, is the Quran and the Sunni. The science, we, we are very lacking, but there's no conflict. Because maybe there's a conflict today, but tomorrow they'll find a theory that, that denies the first theory, and now we are in, in that of Quran is always right. So I think that's how I look at it. There's no conflict at all. The conflict is because science is never a conflict. So we don't believe. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Okay, inshallah. So yeah, just my conclusion remarks based upon what Daniel was saying at the end is that when we're talking about the Quran and Sunnah, it's really important that we have a strong foundation of understanding our religion. So like this talk is not sufficient you know, for people to really exist in the modern world. And it's not just sufficient to just pick up a book of hadith and just read it on your own. You know, so I would just strongly encourage each and every single one of you to really take Islamic education seriously because we live in a world, we live in a society where people have many different ideologies, many different worldviews that are challenging the beliefs of Islam. And if we don't have a strong foundation, it's very easy to get sucked up into those things. So, quick uh, advertisement, inshallah. <laughs> so I have started a school about six years ago called California Islamic University. We have uh, access to 22 online courses. We have one of our courses is on beliefs. It's about theology. It tells you how to deal with these issues. How do we, you know, believe in Allah? Why do we believe in Allah? Um, how do we respond to some of the arguments that are presented about free will, predestination? You know, uh, about you know why evil exists. All of those things. So, if you're interested, you can check out our website, calislamic.com, or you can grab one of these uh, little flyers from here. Jazakallah khair, Shaykh Ibsal Ma'amla, you just said that they are happy that you are very blessed to have you. Takbir. Allah. Takbir. Allah. Takbir. Allah. Takbir. Allah. Very, very good announcements before we pray. Salat al Isha, inshaAllah. Um, next uh, Saturday, inshaAllah, we have the continuation of our spiritual healing class, which will be at 7 15. Tomorrow, actually, will be a continuation of uh, an open discussion, not necessarily a lecture, just open discussion. On the topics discussed today with Ustad Ben Yaqid that you will be staying the next day for middle school, high school, and college uh, students, inshallah. That will be tomorrow at 7.15, open discussion with Ustad Ben uh, Next, inshallah, uh, September 22nd will, will be our back to school uh, Cubs Sunday. So for kindergarten for fifth grade, we're going to have a program from 3.30 to 5.30 p.m. For kindergarten through fifth grade, inshallah, that will be September 22nd. Uh, September 29th is our annual fundraising dinner for the community night. We will have uh, Ahmad Shukri uh, here for that program, as well as uh, Sheikh Muhammad Abbas. And October 27th will be our big uh, 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 Quran and Nasheed night, which will be October 27th, inshallah. Um, if you have uh, any questions or anything, 
Uh, please feel free to come to us if you have any thoughts of topics that you want to be addressed at the community night. Please let us know, inshallah, and we'll take it into consideration. Again, JazakAllah, everybody for coming, and we will.